Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee of 2022. Uh, we're going to begin this morning just with a confirmation agenda item one that we're content to take item three, which is consideration of the committee's 21-22 annual report in private. Are members agreed? We are. Thank you. Um, we're joined this morning by Fergus Ewing remotely and Mr Sweeney, who will be with us shortly. Uh, agenda item two is consideration of continued petitions. And the first of those continued petitions is petition number 1804 to halt the Highlands and Islands Airport Limited's air traffic management strategy. Uh, this was lodged by Alistair McKeegan, John Doig and Peter Henderson on behalf of Pembekula Community Council. And as those who follow our affairs will know, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to halt Highlands and Islands Airport Limited's air traffic management strategy project and to conduct an independent assessment of the decisions and decision-making process of the ATMS project. I'd like to welcome Engels Lyon. Good morning to you, the Managing Director of Highlands and Islands Airports Limited, uh, who is joining us remotely, and I very, very much appreciate um, you making your schedule available to participate in our discussion this morning. Uh, members have had a number of questions. We, we're, we're quite familiar with the ground. We've had various evidence sessions with various people as we go along. So very happy in the first instance uh, to move to the first of those questions. But if there is anything you'd like to say just in advance of that, um, then I'd be very happy for you to do so. Just to say thank you for agreeing to see us today and for hosting me remotely. It helps. <laughs> Great. OK, well, um, first question then is I will put and then various members of the committee. We are also joined, I should say, this morning by uh, Liam MacArthur and Rhoda Grant. Um, and I'll be very happy to uh, invite them to say something uh, after the committee members have placed the uh, principal questions in evidence. Can I ask you, Mr Lyon, because this has come up in a number of... I mean, obviously, the, the petition was first lodged before there was a change in the uh, strategy of uh, High Al. Um, and a number of those who've given evidence to us um, have been suspicious of the motivation underpinning all of that. So given that you have now changed your mind, you know, after five years of pursuing the ATMN strategy, was that wholly driven or principally driven by financial considerations or is there a wider basis for the change of position? Thank you for the question. There were a number of moving parts in taking that decision to take a different strategic direction. There was the industrial action, which I'd like to go into some detail on. There was a financial element. There was a campaign that had been run by Prospect supporting MSPs, and there was also the output from our island impact. So a number of different moving parts that brought us to the table. If I could perhaps start with the industrial action. The industrial action took three different constituent elements. The first was a day of strike action. For airlines and airline passengers and airports, that's hugely disruptive. But a day of industrial action can be managed airlines will put passengers on to the following day or the preceding day. Hugely disruptive, hugely regrettable, but manageable. Then there was an overtime ban. And the overtime ban saw passengers sometimes unable to get into some of the remote airfields, or sometimes unable to leave these remote airfields. That, again, was hugely disruptive to tens of thousands of passengers, and it cost Logan Air approximately £2 million. But again, that is manageable within the grand context of, of what we do up in. The thing that really put the bite on the organisation was when training stopped. Training stopped as a result of the action that was taken by the trade union. And training is the lifeblood for what we do in the Highlands and Islands Airport. So we had a number of controllers in the control tower who could not progress because of the industrial action. So that has had an effect on the airports, and indeed we are still working that out, and that's still coming to a conclusion at Inverness Airport, where we're still experiencing some closures because of the training that we were unable to undertake during that industrial action. Training, a major, major element for us. We also had the financial element. The financial element, when we went out to tender for the remote tower element, we received four bids back to the organisation. And the bids ranged from being almost on budget to being, some, in one case, three and a half times the budget. 
And when we looked at the bids in some detail, there were some significant variances about how organisations had priced risk, how some organisations had priced cost certainty. And when we looked at the thing in the round, we decided that there was considerable uncertainty in these bids that we had received. Now, we had a very firm steer from Transport Scotland that the budget was the budget. So that we could not contemplate going over the budget. So at that point, again, that was something that came into play. We also had the output from our island impact. Island impact assessment said there are things that you should be doing with the local authorities and mitigate the impact of your decisions. So we have a number of things on the go at the moment and at that time try and mitigate the impact of our decisions. One was the sustainable aviation test environment in Orkney, and you saw the benefits of that last week when Royal Mail made their announcement about UAVs covering the north and west of Scotland. We have some exciting developments to take place in Stornoway, and we have other developments elsewhere. But notwithstanding all of that, that was insufficient to move the local authorities from removing their objection. And as I say, there was the campaign that was being run by Prospect and unsupported MSPs. So when combined, if you were to say to me, was it the finances? No, it wasn't. Were finances part of it? They were a consideration. But the principal thing for us was to get the industrial action off the table because it was beginning to impact upon our ability to run the business and to continue to provide lifeline services to the north and west of Scotland. Okay, thank you. I, I, I understand all of that, that, and that's a very helpful exposition of the position. It, it, it sounds... I would mean, choose my words carefully, but it sounds as if it was force majeure that motivated the change in the position, as opposed to a re-evaluation of the actual original thinking of HIAL, and that it's an evolution of the various points that you just raised that led to the change of heart. I mean, is there is there a Choose the word. Is there a bitterness with um, Hial that the change has now been uh, brought around? That this is not the route that you would have preferred to go. And I suppose that leads me to ask a question, which has come up in some of the evidence we've received. Although Prospect seemed reassured on the point, but is there a commitment that the strategy that will now be followed is the one that will be sustained, and that any suggestion that there would be a return to the original proposal after a period of time and when there's a further window of opportunity is not now part of a of a plan one way or the other? I suppose to, to answer you, your, your first question about being bitter, there's absolutely no bitterness. We, we've got a business to run serving the north and west of serving these remote communities in the north and west of the islands. It's a privilege to do that as the chief executive for the business. We worked incredibly closely with Prospect from August last year to arrive at the position we're at just now. And I think credit has to go to those that were involved in these discussions for getting this over the line is the first thing. So absolutely no bitterness. The second thing to say is in terms of strategy, we've agreed with Prospect a review in five years' time. And that review will be an independent review and will stand by the findings of that independent both sides will stand by the findings of that independent. What we can't do is we can't tie the hands of incoming boards and chief executives and all the rest of it as to what will happen in five years' time. So for the period between now and five years, there will be no pursuing of the original strategy. Okay, thank you. That's that's very clear. Um, Fergus Ewing. Thank you. Wilson, thank you for setting out very clearly the exposition of why you changed tack. And uh, I think you've, you've set out um, in a very candid and helpful fashion compelling reasons as to why you changed tack. Um, I wanted to ask about an area uh, which has been raised by Mr Henderson in, in the last evidence session, which is the ex extent to which changing tack has had a, a cost to it in terms of expenditure, which I think could fairly be described as abortive. Uh, in other words, expenditure pursuing a model which has now been, if you like, um, shelved 
for, for five years. Um, uh, so, could, could I just ask, firstly, what level of abortive expenditure there has been on the development of the air traffic management um, strategy, please? When we reported this to the committee in January and to Mr MacArthur in December of last year, we quoted a figure of £9 million. And if I could give you some detail on that £9 million, it would, perhaps, it would help put some of that in context. In the first instance, if that, of that £9 million, approximately £1.4 million is down to staff costs. Now, these staff members were originally taken on to provide, if you like, that bank of staff that would help us manage the project. However, given some of the issues that we were experiencing across the company in terms of staff shortages, these staff members were deployed to these roles at other sites in Highlands and Islands airports and continue to be deployed, to be deployed in Highlands and Islands airports. So of that £9 million, you can subtract £1.4 million in revenue. And of the capital sum, contained within that is a simulator that was bought at £324,000. And that's a simulator that will be used to train Highlands and Islands air traffic control staff for the next 10 years. So that's an asset that sat on the books and is depreciated. So it is not directly attributable to the cost. Finally, there has been much discussion around New Century House and what we do with New Century House. New Century House was bought below market value for a purpose, perhaps to house our surveillance centre. However, things have changed. New Century House is now getting used for a temporary training facility. But what we are doing and are midway through doing is evaluating our estate in Inverness for two reasons. The first is that the reason for buying new uh, for holding new century has changed. And secondly, at our head office, which was at capacity pre-pandemic, pre we now have 67% of our team working hybrid, so we now have capacity in head office. So looking at things in the round, we're going to try and determine the best way forward. Now, as a result of that, if New Century House becomes service to requirements, that valuable piece of real estate will be sold, we're not precious about it, will be sold, and the money will be returned to Highlands and Islands Airport. Bear in mind, it was bought at the low market value. Um, well, th th thank you for, for that. So, the, the headline figure of nine million needs to be reduced by various factors, which actually, um, uh, although the cost was incurred in pursuit of the project, which is Michelle uh, are actually serving other valuable purposes for HIAL. So I understand that. I mean, are you able to say how much you would ex expect the, the range of, of uh, the price to be for the sale of New Century House and in relation to the to the purchase? And would that, if you like, as, as you seem to be implying, uh, further reduce the nine million cost thus far by maybe aggressing a profit? Yes, that, that, that's correct. The, the building, I don't want to go into the commercial details just now, but if you look at the £9 million and assuming we realise similar to the purchase price, then that £9 million will reduce by 1.4 to 4, 4.5, so it will be 5.5, will reduce down to circa 5.5 million. Okay. Well, it's, it's not the, the function of this committee, as you understand, Ingalls, to, 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 to go into these matters in detail. Our, our function is simply to give voice to petitioners who come to the Parliament with, with a, a, a cause and um, to seek, if you like, transparency and accountability. So it's not our pur purpose to go into this in detail, but it is our job to decide whether or not someone else should. And I'm just therefore wanting to ask a simple question, which is, would you support HIAL's handling of the air traffic management strategy process being the subject of an external review by an organisation such as Audit Scotland? We'd, we'd welcome we'd welcome that, Mr. Ewing. We've got absolutely no trouble with that at all. And whether it's uh, Audit Scotland or, or A and other, I would query whether Audit Scotland is the right body for no other reason than Audit Scotland have not audited HIAL thus far. We have our own external auditors, but very very happy with Prince. Um, is there any other body that you think that could carry out an audit? And I'm mindful here, Ingalls, if I may just make this point, that any 
body looking into this would have to have, I think, rather more than a rudimentary understanding of the issues involving air traffic control, which are fairly complex, as we have seen from the Civil Aviation Authority. But I, I had pondered whether Audit Scotland were, in fact, the right body for the reasons that you have stated. Uh, but I, I just wondered if, if you yourself could come up with any, um, if you like, way in which public accountability could be achieved by a body that has a, a reasonable knowledge in the issues involved, which I think would be essential to do a proper job. There, there may be an opportunity for peer review. There are a number of, you know, capable organisations within the Scottish Government that could undertake some degree of peer review. There may also be an opportunity for the committee to speak directly with our external auditors, who do audit us on a number of topics. On a routine basis. Um, th thank you very much. I, that completes my questions. I think I just lost the last word or so of what you said, but I hope everybody else can hear you. No, we didn't. Sorry, we, we did lose the last sentence, <laughs> Mr. Lyon, if you just wanted to just conclude that point again. Yes, what I was saying is that um, I'm very happy to make that connection with our external auditors. We're an independent company. Happy if you want to speak to them about carrying out that kind of review. That's great. Thank you very much. David Torrens. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Mr. Lyon. Mr. Lyon, the lack of engagement with local communities about um, the future um, of air um, traffic control in these areas caused real problems. C can I ask why that was, and can I get assurances of you that if there's anything to change in the future strategy of, for the area, that you will engage with these communities? Good morning. Nice to meet you. We had a prior to announcing the strategy, the company that did the work for us undertook a number of engagements. Since announcing the strategy and up to the pandemic, we undertook over 200 sets of different engagements across the Highlands and Islands. During the pandemic and up to date, we have taken a very different approach with our community engagement. We were held up recently by one of the local authorities as being an example of best practice. So where we are today is a long way from where we were at the start of the episode, if you like. And with the benefit of hindsight, would we do things differently? I think we have learned, and uh, that's something that we will do as we go forward. Because as I say, that local authority has held us up an example of best practice, and that's good to hear, and it's a good benchmark to set for ourselves. Thank you. Um, Mr Lyon, why were health staff and, um, and recognised trade unions not involved in the development of air traffic management strategy from the outset? And how do you do, intend to involve staff in the development of any future, future strategies? Would that not help to industrial relations? Yes, the staff, some of the staff were involved prior to announcing the outcome of the strategy. And since the devised strategic direction, we have managed, we have worked with our staff to help inform that discussion by setting up a number of working groups, which I'm sure Prospect would uh, confirm that that has helped build a number of the bridges. Uh, if you were to ask me, have we built enough of the bridges? Have we repaired enough of the bridges? I would say no, it's work in progress. It's work in progress. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Sweeney. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Um, the committee has heard concerns that high oil management placed too much faith in the Air Traffic Management 2030 strategy, scoping study produced by the consultants Helios, the results of which relied significantly on emerging new technology. How do you respond to such concerns? Helios provided a report, and within the report there were a number of options. The recommended option was the way that the board decided to go at that point in time but it could have chosen some of the other options. But it decided to choose the one that was recommended. This is the first thing. Since then, that board has since moved on to, to pastures new, and we have a new board. And in June 2020, I think, the new board sat down and went through all of the evidence available and confirmed that the decision at that point to pursue the strategy that we had was the right decision. At that point, we had also employed a new Chief Operating Officer, and he was given carte blanche to review everything also and decide whether or not 
we were still pursuing the right strategy and he came to that point also. So Helios, if you like, provided the options and the board decided to pursue that option at that point. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Mr Lyon, the communities were very fearful and anxious about this whole process. Uh, and, you know, they still are. There is no question that they, they feel that there may be some loss or some reduction or some diminution of some of the, the facilities that they would expect. So can you give assurances to communities that are served by Hyal Airports that they will not see any reduction, diminution within the services or aviation safety from the rollout of the new air traffic control system and the procedures that it goes? Because, as I say, they still are very fearful of what is planned and what will happen. But first of all, just to and thank you for, for raising the issue of, of safety. Whatever we do in Highlands and Islands airports is always to improve upon levels of safety. We operate in one of the most highly regulated industries, not in the UK, but so whatever we do has to lift of safety. We don't compromise. What you have in the Highlands and Islands today is safe, and we have an opportunity to make it safer, which is what we intend to do. In terms of the diminution of service, again, by introducing some of the changes that we hope to introduce, the idea is that we will achieve one of our core objectives, which is to improve resilience. One of the reasons for embarking on the strategy in the first place was to help improve resilience. What we can't find ourselves in is a position that we find ourselves in in, in, in a couple of the airports where we were struggling for to achieve manning levels and we had airport closures. Because again, and if, if one thing demonstrated it was the pandemic and our ability to keep lifeline services going. These are real lifeline services to remote communities, and it's all about preserving these links and enhancing them. You know, that, that is the crux of the matter, about supporting and ensuring that communities do have these services. So can I ask you, what lessons have you learned from this whole fiasco uh, that has, been, has had communities up in arms, uh, MSPs up in arms, and, uh, and the, the whole idea of that? Uh, so what lessons have you learned from dealing with this over the last five years, and how can you put some of those lessons that you may have learned into practical uh, to ensure that there will be practical action for the communities that still have much anxiety about what might come out from this process? I shared, I shared something with uh, one of your colleagues who's at, the, who's at the committee today when the same question was asked of me when we, when we met. And I said that this idea of sharing some of these challenges that we have early on would be more would be very helpful to us and to and to your good selves. So that we have a very open book approach to sharing these challenges so that we can work on solutions, whether the joint solutions or we just tell folk what's going on. And I think that would be for me, that would be the, the biggest lesson that we could take away from this, is to improve that communication. And I go back to the, the point I made earlier, where we've now moved our communication and information flow to such an extent that one of the local authorities says, listen, you're an example of best practice, you're proud of what you do, and I'd like to see that continue going forward, because that will ensure that we're, there are no surprises going forward. Thank you. Um, I, I, we have uh, two uh, colleagues with us this morning. And uh, I'd very much like, uh, that's the formal questions from the committee members. I, I'd very much like to give uh, both Mr. MacArthur and uh, Rhoda Grant an opportunity to either to make an observation or actually to put a question, I think, just uh, given the, the importance of the issue and the, the, the fact that this, this evidence, uh, I think, is an opportunity for, almost the final opportunity for the committee to kind of consider all the various bits of evidence we've received. Mr. MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Convener, and good morning, um, Engels. You talked earlier about, um, in response to questions from the committee, about uh, with hindsight things would have been done differently. Um, I think we can all be accused of um, having wisdom with, with hindsight, but, but having lived this process for a number of years, if not all five of them, um, it, it seems to me that hindsight wasn't really necessary from, from very much the outset. Um, the concerns about the cost 
calculations and estimates being wide of the mark in terms of what would actually be required to, to deliver this um, safely uh, and successfully um, were, were out of alignment with, I think, what many um, within the sector uh, were suggesting uh, would be the case. The, the staff concerns about um, the proposals and the implications for, 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 for jobs, including in the islands, uh, were very evident from the get-go. Uh, the opposition within local communities, including um, local authorities, again, were very evident. And indeed, Hyle's own consultants identified the remote tower model as the most complex uh, and risky of the options. And yet, um, over the course of the four or five years that I engaged with, with Hyle, repeatedly I was told, and repeatedly um, through public statements, the, that the public was told that this was the only viable option to deliver um, safety and, and, and in accordance with changing regulations, the air traffic um, management system uh, required across the Highlands and Islands. And it, 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 I appreciate we, we are now in a different place, but I think it's difficult to accept that one needed hindsight to have arrived at that conclusion and that there, there is real anger and frustration that's taken um, the best part of five years to get to a conclusion that, that many had arrived at um, pretty much from the from the get go. So I think with and that's as much just for the record. I don't think that's a that's a question. That's an observation. But I think um, over and above the the, the question that, that Fergus Ewan raised about the audit, and I welcome the the response you've you've given to that. Um, I think there were concerns raised um, previously by Mr. Henderson that we could find ourselves in a similar situation in relation to centralised radar surveillance. That Again, we have um, a, a, a proposal being taken forward by HIAL where there are concerns among staff about the implications in, in, in each of the, 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 the airfields um, and that those concerns are not being given due weight and that we could find ourselves some way down the line dealing with a, a, a similar situation. Um, where HIL is going to be forced um, to, to reconsider those proposals. So, so what assurance can you give us um, that that isn't the case, that, that staff concerns in relation to centralised radar surveillance will be taken properly into, uh, into account? That's, that's, thank you for that. And I'm disappointed to hear that. We've um, continued the working parties. We've a, announced the revised strategy and then B, in terms of how we deliver it, if I've been completely honest with you, um, the number of attendees at the working parties has dropped dramatically since announcing the, the strategy. And the working parties are the opportunity to say this is good, this is bad, or we're indifferent on this matter. So I'll take that away and I'll discuss that with Prospect and I'll try and find a way of encouraging more participation at the working parties to ensure that we have that right level of feedback between the units. I think just one other final question. Obviously, um, one of the drivers for this, um, uh, the move to the remote towers, was the, the concerns around recruitment and retention of air traffic control staff in certain air, um, airports. Um, I think the concern that I and others were raising that um, this wasn't necessarily an issue um, at, at some of the airports and that Heil had a track record when embarked on on a local recruitment exercise of recruiting and retaining staff very successfully. But when they moved to, to, to try and recruit sort of ready-made um, air traffic controllers from Sweden and, and elsewhere, which were a short-term option, in a sense, what, what they ended up doing was, was reaping the whirlwind of that because they were always going to leave. So is there, a, is there an assurance from Heil that going forward uh, with this new model, that there will be a return to, to looking to, rec to recruit from within the local communities, which has demonstrated itself not just for Heil, but across the public sector and, and indeed the private sector, a far more effective way of identifying people that you may need to put in additional training for, but are far more likely to remain within the organisation over the medium to longer term. We had a, a good discussion up in Shetland the other week where we've just approved it. Just exactly that. That's a young lady that's entered at the at the assistant level and is now moving into the it's now moving into the ACO trainee level. Maintaining local the draw from the local employment market, we will always do. However, 
there, are, there will be occasions when we have to fish in the bigger pool because that's doing that short term fix. So, whilst the primary source of employment should, should always be from our local hinterland, there will be occasions when we do have to fish elsewhere. That's just the nature of the business that we're in. But yes, certainly where we can, it's local stuff. And you'll even see just now that uh, when we're advertising posts, our posts, providing they're not operational, they're based, they're based all over the country, all over the, the North America. Uh, Rhoda Grant, is there a point, an observation or a question you would like to, to make? A, a, a bit of both, if, if you don't mind, convener, is that OK? Um, I won't go over ground covered by um, the committee, um, apart from to say that, you know, I'm really pleased that Prospect and HIAL are working so well together and that staff are now involved in the working groups. There is a level of distrust as to why we have reached this point and what and, and what brought us here, which you answered at the beginning. I suppose the independent review in five years' time is the thing that is causing some concern to people. Is this just a pause? And will that review bring us back to where we once were? So I suppose my first question is, how do you rebuild trust, not just with the workforce, which I do understand from yourself and Prospect, that work is ongoing, but within the communities you serve as well. I think I think the the community one is a is if you like it's a it's a longer term project than with the, with the staff. The, 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 our teams are closer to us. The, the communities is a is going to be a longer term project. But as I say, we've started rolling out this revised engagement programme that we have, and it does seem to be yielding benefits. We're speaking to a lot of MSPs, MPs, local authorities, the feedback we're getting is A, positive about the change, but B, equally positive about the level of engagement, about the honesty and the transparency that we're sharing in these engagement sessions. And I think that's part of the project, that we get to that point where you ultimately know almost as much about the business as we do. And I think if we can get to that point, then it, it just helps. OK, thank you. Can I just ask a few questions about radar? Because I understand um, radar was the, for Shetland, which is the, air, the, the one, I suppose, remote airport that uses radar at the moment, was to transfer from Nats um, to Hyal. But there's been a delay in that. Does that delay, you know, what's the reasons for that delay? And does that augur well for radar at the other airports being centralised to, to Inverness? Shetland is a, is a green field site. It's something that the CAA haven't done. I don't know that they've done it in Scotland before. Certainly we haven't done it before, so it's a really complex project. Slightly behind in terms of some of the staffing issues that we've got there, in terms of the training issues. But once these are out of the way, and that's, that's close to being the case, then we'll be able to live and learn that project See where we go from there. And is there an option um, to have radar controlled locally at the airports? I mean, almost in the opposite direction of travel that was happening previously. Would would it be an option to have that radar controlled locally at those airports, creating more jobs and maybe following on from the recruitment pattern that Liam MacArthur talked about, where local people could be recruited and trained, and that would actually create more jobs in our local communities where they're desperately needed? One of the issues that we talked about today and previously is around resilience. If we have these people in the one, under the one roof, then it allows us to say, for example, that somebody could be controlling Sumbara, uh, radar Sambara on Monday, and because of sickness, illness, or absences, away, they could be controlling it on Thornaway on Tuesday, and potentially even Kirkwall on Wednesday. By having these individuals under the one roof, we are able to get that resilience, that economy of scale that builds that level of resilience into the airports. That's the basis on which we agreed the compromise with Prospect and their colleagues in the in the town. But you wouldn't revisit that. You wouldn't look at it again. I'm, I'm well, just kind of conscious hard. it might be a way of rebuilding that trust and reassuring communities that you were looking to work with these communities as well. 
I, I would suggest that's maybe something that gets looked at under the five-year review. Thank you. I'm very grateful, Mr Lyon. Is there anything we've not covered that you might just want to add as a final observation or comment? No, that's been fine for me, Mr Carlo. Thank you. Yeah, and so thank you very much uh, for your evidence this morning. Uh, very much appreciate the time you've given and the comprehensive way in which you've uh, answered the various commission uh, questions from committee members and from our, our visiting colleagues this morning. Um, Members, uh, are we content to consider the evidence that we've heard today at a future meeting? Uh, we are, in which case uh, I will suspend the meeting shortly and thank you again for your participation. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. Our second item this morning is the uh, consideration of continuing petitions, the first of which, uh, well, sorry, we're in our second item, sorry, but the second of our continuing petitions is petition number 1855, the pardon and memorialise those convicted under the Witchcraft Act of 1563, uh, lodged by Claire Mitchell QC, calling on the Scottish Parliament uh, to urge the Scottish Government to pardon, apologise and create a national monument to memorialise those people in Scotland accused and convicted as witches under the Witchcraft Act of 1563. Um, at our last consideration of this petition in, on 23rd of February, uh, we heard evidence from the petitioners, Claire Mitchell QC and Zoe Venditossi, and agreed to consider the evidence at a future meeting. Uh, following that meeting, members will be aware that during the uh, parliamentary debate on International Women's Day, the First Minister gave an apology to those people in Scotland accused and convicted as witches under the Witchcraft Act of 1563. Since our last consideration of this petition, uh, we've also now received a response from the petitioner welcoming the First Minister's apology and also the work being undertaken uh, by Natalie Dawn to take forward a member's bill in relation to the pardon. Um, unfortunately, Natalie Dawn's not able to join us this morning, but she has uh, provided a brief statement uh, which has indicated to members in advance of today's meeting that she is uh, consulting on her proposed member's bill, uh, which focuses on the pardon. Uh, which will be published imminently, uh, but does not deal with the, uh, she says, issue of any national memorial. Uh, members who, I unfortunately wasn't here to consider the evidence, obviously read it carefully. Do members have any uh, comments or suggestions for action? Alexander Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, convener. Uh, I think it is important now for us to, to get some of the uh, evidence uh, from Natalie Dawn herself. Uh, obviously, she is consulting and it would be useful for, for an update from us from how she is progressing with that, uh, that member's bill. Uh, and I also think it would be advantageous for us to uh, contact and write to the Scottish Government requesting uh, that they give some consideration to uh, the whole memorialisation uh, of individuals who have been convicted as witches under the Act of 1563. Thank you, Convener. 
Any other? David Torrance. Just to add to that, um, Convener, I wonder if we could write to the Scottish Government as well and ask what public, public body would be involved in this, um, so we could go to them direct to see if they would support it. Yes, I think that's that, that's a, a good idea. I mean, uh, it, clearly we can't commission a memorial. It may well be there's a committee of the Parliament that could pursue the matter, but it would be helpful, I think, if the Scottish Government indicated if there was a body they thought might be appropriate, uh, assuming they respond positively to the idea, that if there was a body they thought might be the appropriate one to try and advance this. Uh, are, are members in agreement with, with those recommendations? <laughs> we are. That's good. Thank you. Um, petition number 1860, New Legislation for Prescription and Limitation Act, uh, lodged by Jennifer Morrison Holdham. And this petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to amend the Prescription and Limitation Act to allow retrospective claims to be made. We considered this last on the 2nd of February and we agreed to write to the Minister for Community Safety. Uh, following that meeting, we have now received responses from the Scottish Government, uh, which include a copy of the response the Minister received from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. From the information provided, it has appeared that information on the use of judicial discretion under Section 19A of the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1973 to disapply time limits from bringing legal proceedings and certain actions is not currently collected in a way that allows for it to be easily analysed or, or interrogated. Uh, do members have any comments or suggestions for action? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think we should write to the Scottish Government to ask whether it intends to take any further action to collect and evaluate information on the use of judicial discretion under Section 19A of the Prescription and Limitation Act 1973 and to disapply time limits for bringing legal proceedings in certain actions and what actions it might be. Yes, I mean, I'm inclined to agree, although it, it's very clear from the evidence base that while the problem's acknowledged, the resource doesn't exist currently to do anything about it. So I, I think it would be probably sensible trying to just in that correspondence identify if that isn't something that can happen immediately, is it even something that could happen in due course, just from what, no, they, what they're saying. Uh, are members content with that uh, recommendation? Thank you. Uh, petition number 1895, the Mandatory Accountability for Nature Scots Decision-Making Procedures, lodged by Gary Wall, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to make it mandatory for Nature Scot to explain its conservation objectives and decision-making within the framework of the Scottish Regulator Strategic Code. Code of Practice, indeed, and Scottish Government's guidance right first time. Uh, again, we last considered this on the 2nd of February. We agreed to write to Nature Scott, asking whether it routinely provides information about its conservation objectives when rejecting licensing applications. In their response, Nature Scott explained that the circumstances under which licences can be granted do not always relate to conservation objectives. They state that licence refusals are routinely issued and their approach is, always to ex is to always explain to applicants the reasons for the refusals against the relevant legal texts. In their recent submission, the petitioner cites case law, which they believe highlights the requirement for Nature Scott to balance objectives when deciding whether to grant exemptions for licensing. And they also stress the requirement of Nature Scott to be transparent, accountable, consistent and proportionate, and express concerns about the conflicts with Nature Scott's policies and a lack of oversight and accountability. Uh, do members have any comments on this petition to help us advance our thinking? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think we should write to Nature Scott just to ask him and to be um, reassured by them that their processes are in place for licensing refusals and the reasons for refusal are transparent and clear to any recipient applied consistently across Scotland. I wonder if we could also ask them if they have uh, appropriate guidance for staff in this procedure of licence refusals to ensure that the issues raised by the petitioner in regard to transparency and clarity are being addressed by consistent procedures. Yeah, I think that seems reasonable. Are we agreed with that, colleagues? We are. Uh, petition number 1905, the public inquiry into the response of religious organisations to allegations of child sexual abuse since 1950. Uh, this petition was lodged by Angela Rosina Cousins on behalf of the UK XJW's support. 
The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to order a public inquiry into the actions taken by religious organisations in response to child sexual abuse allegations since 1950. Uh, at our last <coughs> consideration of this petition, we heard directly from the petitioner, Angela, uh, about her experiences and the issues she would like to see addressed. Uh, can I again thank Angela for taking the time to come to the Scottish Parliament to speak with the committee on what was clearly a particularly difficult topic. And I think I speak for all members when I say that the committee found Angela's evidence uh, compelling. Difficult to deliver, but compelling. In that session, we heard that victims of this abuse are hidden in plain sight and need to be heard, as they are often isolated from everyday life. The petitioner made her case for the Scottish Government to conduct a public inquiry into this matter and raised the significance of mandatory reporting mechanisms. Now, members will also recall the submission we received from the Independent Inquiry into Child Sex Abuse, which is underway in England and Wales. And the inquiry undertook a specific investigation into child protection and religious organisations and has published its report along with recommendations, including recommendations for further work. Members can find a link to the full report in their papers. This was a difficult uh, session for the committee, and I wonder if members, having reflected in the evidence, have any comments on how we might now choose to proceed? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to keep the petition open and write to the Scottish Government to highlight the evidence session and the findings of an independent inquiry in England and Wales, stating that, that it notes the findings of the independent inquiry into child sex abuse report in England and Wales and the issues that are identified are requiring further consideration. Also to highlight the petitioner's experience, which reflects many of the findings of the independent inquiry and the issues identified as requiring further consideration. And to highlight to the Scottish Government that there are no plans to extend the scope of inquiry into the abuse of the children in care in Scotland and that there are current gaps in, the, in Scotland in progressing in consideration of the issues related to the response of religious organisations who are informed about allegations of abuse against children who are not in care. Alexander Stewart. I would very much concur with that, uh, Convener. I think this, as you indicated, was a difficult situation, but a situation that is there and we need to get more clarity on that. And I think uh, what has been suggested would give us some of that clarity at this stage uh, for us to then consider what gaps there may well be in the process uh, going forward to ensure that there is uh, an opportunity to see what has happened uh, in England and Wales with reference to some of this as well, uh, because it is very relevant uh, uh, to the petitioner and uh, what she was trying to bring forward at the time. Any other colleagues wish to comment? I mean, I, I continue to be perplexed by the fact that the inquiry in England and Wales has managed to accommodate the review into abuse in the care sector. And I'm still unclear, having that being the case, and why this resistance there is to closing the gap in the scope of the inquiry in Scotland. And, and, I, I, and I think that's very much the uh, petitioner's perspective from the evidence we heard and I think it's a point that remains largely unanswered. Uh, the argument that it would create a difficulty or a delay doesn't seem to have been borne out by the ability of the inquiry elsewhere to accommodate that area of abuse and I think that is something we really do want to try and pursue. So uh, are we content with the recommendations that have been made in relation to the evidence we heard? We are, thank you. Uh, petition number 1912, uh, funding for council venues, uh, lodged by Wendy Dunsmore, calling on the Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to provide the necessary additional revenue to local councils to run essential services and venues. Uh, we considered uh, this petition last. We agreed to investigate the issues with the local authority chief executives. And we've received responses from COSLA, from Angus Council, North Ayrshire Council, Arc Island Butte, North Lanarkshire, and from Fife Council. Uh, the responses highlighted a number of common challenges for leisure and sport funding at a local authority level, including low customer return rates after pandemic lockdowns, resulting in reduced revenue for leisure venues, a continuing financial pressure as a result of funding cuts, and ring-fenced funding from the Scottish Government, creating limited flexibility for councils. 
The local authorities also highlighted a number of changes in their service provision to tackle the issue of financial sustainability. However, concerns remain over the allocation of funding for sport and leisure activities in the future. Uh, so very much echoing the concerns of the petitioner. Uh, do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Alexander Stewart. Th thank you, Convener. Delighted that a number of local authorities did respond, but it's only a small number in comparison to what we have uh, in, in local authorities out there. Uh, but I do think they capture uh, some of the areas that are very relevant, uh, and there's no doubt that the pandemic and the impact that took place. Uh, I wonder if it is uh, for us now to refer this petition to the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee uh, in, in the context of the committee's wider consideration of local government and authority finances and the, the post-pandemic recovery. That would be my suggestion, convener. Colleagues, do others have a view? No. I agree. Thank you very much. Then uh, we will... Uh, sorry, Fergus, were you nodding in assent there too? Uh, Mr Ewing, you were nodding in assent. Yes, I, I concur. Thank you. Uh, we'll do so then. Uh, Position number 1913, to fast-track future adult disability payment applications for people undergoing cancer treatment, lodged by Wendy Swain. Calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create a separate department within Social Security that will fast-track the adult disability payment, ADP, applications for people with cancer diagnosis whilst they are undergoing treatment. Considered last on the 2nd of February, uh, we agree to seek views from Macmillan Cancer Support and Cancer Research UK. Uh, Macmillan Cancer Support's response requested that the committee urge the Scottish Government to ensure that the new system of adult disability payment in Scotland follows a number of key principles. Those principles are set out in their submission and relate to the processing times for applications, fast-tracking applications, and making greater use of paper-based assessments and evidence from medical professionals. Uh, do members have any comments or suggestions? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think we should keep the petition open, but in doing so, I'd like to write to the Scottish Social Security, Security Agency um, to highlight the concerns of the petitioner and the proposals for improving to the SSSA system as set out in the written submission from Macmillan Cancer Support and recommend that the SSSA should take aboard, like regularly publishing processing times for benefit applications broken down into, by condition ensuring that the process times for special rule cases um, are kept a minimum period for around a few days and reduce the processing time for applications from the normal rules to non-terminal patients to 11 weeks or less, and to consider a scope to maximise the use of paper-based assessments and make greater use of evidence from medical professions to limit the need of unnecessary face-to-face -face assessments. Colleagues, uh, are we content to progress the proposals as identified by Mr Torrance? We are. Thank you. So we'll keep the petition open and progress accordingly. Uh, petition 1917 uh, to provide full legal aid to all parents fighting for access to their children. This petition lodged by Amy Stevenson calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to provide full legal aid to all parents who are fighting for access to their child or children regardless of income. We last considered this on the 23rd of February and we agreed to write to a number of stakeholders. And since our last consideration, we have received written submissions from the petitioner, from Relationships Scotland and Shared Parenting Scotland. And they highlight a number of issues with the current legal aid provision with, that is dependent on income, including the costs of legal proceedings, the impact of the financial barriers on children, the importance of early resolution mechanisms, and the need to consider children's rights and put children's interests first. Uh, colleagues, I'm inclined to write to the Scottish Government highlighting the evidence that we've received, uh, requesting that legal aid provision relating to parental responsibilities is included as part of its planned review of the legal aid system and asking them for information on the scope of this review, now that it's underway, the plans to consult and the timetable for this and the timetable for bringing forward the legal aid reform bill. Uh, does that proposal meet with the approval of the committee? It does. Thank you. Uh, petition number 1925 to bring HGV speed limit on major trunk roads to 50 miles an hour in line with other parts of the UK, lodged uh, by David Singleton, uh, and self-evidently urges the Scottish Government, uh, or us, the Scottish Parliament, to urge the Scottish Government to increase the 40 mile an hour speed limit for HGVs to 50 miles an hour in Scotland, in line with other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, 
Discussed last by the Committee on the 9th of March, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, and the response of the Scottish Government confirms that speed limits of HGVs are being considered as part of the National Speed Management Review. Uh, Transport Scotland have also indicated that they would be happy to engage directly with the petitioner. Uh, in the light of this, colleagues, are there any suggestions for action? David Torrance. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, considering that the Scottish Government is already considering um, the speed limits for its GVs and that Transport Scotland has indicated their willingness to engage directly with the petitioner in this matter, I think we could maybe close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders. Paul Sweeney. In Convener, can I just add, in closing the petition, perhaps advise the petitioner that maintain a correspondence with their local members of the Scottish Parliament in order to ensure that they receive a satisfactory outcome in their d discussions with Transport Scotland. And then if there are any concerns, they can take that up accordingly rather than it being done through the petitions process. Thank you. Fergus Ewing. Yes, I th thank you, Convener. I do agree with the, two, the suggestions that have been made to close the petition, but to recommend the petitioners and others pursue this matter with their MSP. I just wanted to add that as the MSP who drives A9, I suspect, rather more frequently than perhaps others, um, that the, the this 50 mile speed limit for HGVs on that road has, I think, in the view of the vast majority of my constituents, added considerably to the safety of traffic because prior to that, lorries going at 40 and people breaking the speed limit at 80 gave it a kind of wacky races feel to it. And to be serious, this in massively enhanced, in my view, the risk of fatalities, which is a very, very serious problem. So I, I must admit that from being agnostic at the beginning, I'm now a very firm supporter of this. And I just wanted to put that on the record, really, convener, because I do very much hope that the safety aspects, in particular in the A9, which I think can be monitored and proven if there is a study by Transport Scotland, as I believe there is, into that, would be a very useful piece of evidence to extend this measure to other uh, to, to the rest of Scotland, as indeed is the case throughout the rest of the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Ewing. And uh, are we content, therefore, to close the petition on the basis that has been suggested, but to make sure that the petitioner is aware of the offer to engage and also to draw <coughs> to the petitioner's attention the suggestion that they maintain a close link with their own MSP in order that the petition can be, uh, or the aims of the petition can, can be pursued and achieved. We are content to do so, and I'd like to thank the petitioner very much for uh, bringing that petition to the committee. Um, that concludes our meeting in public this morning, and we will be meeting again in early course. Uh, we haven't just as yet uh, uh, agreed to the date uh, of the next meeting, um, but uh, we will. Our, our members content for me to liaise with the clerks and to agree and advise of that date. Thank you very much. We'll now move into private session.